Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Colin Mahan, I'm a program manager at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. For those of you who may not know, the NASDAQ Center is a nonprofit dedicated to enabling entrepreneurs from all over the world to realize their maximum potentials and ultimately grow. Quick heads up before we get started, we'll open up for live Q&A at the end of the event. So please submit your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and comments in the chat throughout the presentation. None of what we do could be possible without all the amazing sport support from our sponsors, including NASDAQ, Lehigh University, Bank of the West, KPMG, Wilson Sonsini, Woodruff Sawyer, BPM, New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, and Microsoft for Startups. We are continuously humbled by their contributions. During these unique times, we're curious to learn how sentiment is among the entrepreneurs we work with. We'd like to start off by launching a poll to get to know a little bit about how you're feeling about your business right now. So I'm going to launch that. Hoping sentiment is increasing as the year is continuously going through. Looks like optimistic is on the rise, which is great. Again, if you're just joining us, if you wanna to get to know each other, um, if you wanna let us know your name and where you're dialing in from, that'd be great. I'm gonna end this poll and share the results. So looks like the second half of 2020 is looking a little bit more opt optimistic than it was in the beginning of it. So great and happy to have you guys all here. I'm going to launch our next poll, which is, um, stop sharing, which is something that we use to help understand the pain points that our entrepreneurs are experiencing to help guide the programs and curriculum and offerings that we'll continue to offer throughout the year. So what's keeping you up at night? Finance, sales, Marketing, scale, pivot, team, or surviving? Well, it looks like we're all in the right place because sales is right at the top. So I'm gonna share these results. Sales is definitely why we're here to speak to each other today. So glad you guys are here. Um, without any further delay, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our special guest today. Mark Hunter, author of A Mind for Sales, Sales, Daily Habits and Practical Strategies for Sales Success, and also known as The Sales Hunter. Mark inspires trust and confidence by helping salespeople and companies see and achieve the impossible. Mark, over to you. Thank you so much. It is glad, I am glad to be here with each of you in sales. Wow, gee, it's amazing. It's at the top of the charts. You're right, it is. And I'm going to share with you right now some strategies and some ideas from my book, A Mind for Sales. And when we do this, I want you to zero in and I want you to be focusing in on what are those one or two things that you can run with that you can use to help you in your business. Now, what I'm going to do is I just want to kind of unlock a number of ideas. Uh, but here's one I want you to start thinking about. Read this quote, right? This, this, is, this is kind of fascinating if you think about it. We don't sell, we don't sell stuff. We provide outcomes. You see, what it is that you sell is not what you sell. You provide outcomes. You see, the customer really doesn't care what you sell. What they want is they want a solution. And this morning, this morning, there's over 1,000 people that woke up and they need what you have to offer. They, they need what you have to offer. Think about that for a moment. Now, we could change that number. We could change that number from 1,000 to 100 to, to 10,000 to a million. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to be thinking not today on the masses, but I want you to be thinking upon your audience. Now, let, let me drill down on this and, and we're gonna get very macro here in just a second, but I wanna share with you this simple piece. If we have the ability to help someone, okay, if we have the ability to help someone, then it is our responsibility to reach out to them. 
focus in on this for a second, focus in on this, because so many times what happens is the biggest stumbling block we have in sales is people are afraid to engage. People are afraid. So what we do is we want to rely on marketing techniques. And what I want to do is I want to get you over the hurdle to where sales techniques, whether it be raising capital, you know, you're, you're looking for investors, whether or not you're looking for the first customer or you're looking for a mass of customers. You see, if we have the ability to help someone, then it's our obligation to reach out to them. Look at this line down here on the bottom. Sales is about taking the customer to a better place. That's why you do what you do, because you know you can improve the customer's position. That's what, that's what your job is. Now, I want you to come back and I want you to put this into perspective because a lot of people stumble. They, they say, well, it's, it, it's very hard from a sales standpoint for me to reach out to people. Okay. It, it just, it's just very hard. I want to, I want to try to connect with them by way of social media. I want to connect with them by way of other marketing forms, other things. And, and I really just want them to buy from me. I, I, I don't want to do that. Here's a piece. Here's an example. Here's a story. I want you to put yourself into. If you were driving down the highway and late at night, and there's only a few cars on the road, and you come around a curve and you saw a car up ahead that had had a severe accident, severe accident, and, and nobody else was there, would you stop to help those people? You bet you would stop to help those people. You would stop to help those people. But you wouldn't say, well, I don't know them. So maybe I'll connect with them on Instagram. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll see if they're on LinkedIn. Maybe I'll see if they're on Facebook. No, you would, you would stop. You would stop to help them. That's what you would do. You see, that's what sales is all about. You see, if you have the ability to help someone, it is your responsibility to reach out to them. You see, what I want us to do is I want us to understand really what is sales? What is sales? You see, sales, we don't fill customers' needs. We create opportunities. Quick example. Let's look at Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs created the iPhone. Now, I don't know about you, but when Steve Jobs first came out with the iPhone, I had a flip phone, a Motorola flip phone, and a Palm Pilot, and I thought I was pretty, I thought I was pretty, I thought I was good. I was good to go. Flip phone and a Palm Pilot. You see, Steve Jobs came out with this, with this device that had a music player and camera and computer and all in a phone, and I didn't need that. I, I said, I didn't need that. But you see, what it was was this second line here. We know customers don't know what they don't know. You see, Steve Jobs knew that we did not know that we needed an iPhone. See, what was Steve Jobs doing? He was filling a need that we did not realize we had. As an entrepreneur, I want you to, I want you to visualize that in your mind right now. Visualize that in your mind. Because that is absolutely powerful. Because our whole goal, third line down here, our role is to move the customer to a better solution. That's what Steve Jobs was doing. That's what Steve, that was everything Steve Jobs. But see, here's the problem with too many entrepreneurs, too many businesses, is that they play themselves as a rain barrel versus a rain maker. Now, again, let's kind of set the picture. What's a rain barrel and what's a rain maker? A rain barrel. A rain barrel is the barrel that you put outside. I don't know if they still do it. I have no idea. But anyway, it, it, it's visualize a barrel. And the only water that can go into that barrel is water that falls from directly on above it. That's all it can capture. It can't capture water from two feet either side. It can't capture water anywhere. But see, you want to ask yourself, are you a rain barrel or are you a rain maker? I see too many small businesses, too many entrepreneurs, too many startups. What they do is they, is they create themselves as a rain barrel when you really have to be a rain maker. There's a couple of criteria, a couple of questions that you really have to ask yourself. First question there, what percent of the opportunities 
What percent of our business comes from opportunities we create? What percent of business comes from opportunities we create? Now, on the one hand, you can sit there and say, everything, everything, I get that, yeah. But what I want you to do is I want you to begin separating. What is the business that just kind of rolled into you versus what is the business that you had to go out and get? This is so key. See, the business that rolls into you, that's the rain barrel. What I want you to be is I want you to be the rain maker. And, and what I find is too many startups, too many small businesses, they're not creating opportunities. What they're doing is they're creating noise and trying to create business. But what happens is, is, is business never gets fulfilled. Look at this second line down here. What percent of opportunities go unfulfilled because we didn't adequately help the customer see and achieve what they didn't think was possible. You see, what happens here is that we are not dialoguing with our customers. You see, what we're doing is we're playing customer service. We're playing customer service. The customer says, this is what I need. And I say, okay, this, this is how I can help you. See, our objective in sales is to, is to dialogue with our customers because that's how we uncover new needs. See, when Steve Jobs came out with the iPhone, it, it, it's great, but, but I had to dialogue with other people to really understand why do I need, a, why do I need a, a music player? Why do I need a camera? You see, now my dialogue didn't come with Steve Jobs, but my dialogue came with other people who were now early adopters of the iPhone. Think about this for a moment. How much conversation do you really have with your customers? Because the question you have to ask yourself is, what is the value we create for our customers. What is the value we create for our customers? And I want you to take a piece of paper and, or on your computer, whatever, but I want you to really dive into that. It's not what you make. It's not what you make. It's not even how we sell. It's why we sell, to quote Simon Sinek in his book, Why. What, what I'm talking about is what, what, what is the value? What, how is the customer's life better as a result of what we sell? That's, that's what we have. When we can begin to identify that, then we can really begin to open up in terms of determining how we want to sell. Now, let's stay with this whole rainmaker versus rain barrel for a moment. And I want to put this into context of inbound marketing versus outbound marketing. You see, what happens is inbound is really, that's totally rain barrel because the business is coming to us. We wanna create such a presence out there in the marketplace that customers flock to us. But see, outbound marketing, well, here's the big difference. Inbound marketing has depreciating value, depreciating value. I'll explain this in just a bit. Outbound has appreciating value. Let me explain what I mean here, because this is where many, many startups, many, many small businesses get things wrong. You have to have one sales process, one sales process for inbound and a separate sales process for outbound. And what we're going to be focusing in on here for the next 30 minutes is on that appreciating, the outbound piece. Okay. Because now here's the whole thing. Inbound, you get an inbound lead, you get an inbound inquiry, it has depreciating value. Because what has happened is the customer has raised their hand. They, 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 they've raised their hand. They said they have an issue. They have some, and it's like an itch. It needs to get scratched right away. Now, if you, as your, your business, does not scratch that itch for three, four days, you're stalking them. Because they've gone elsewhere. They've moved on to something else. You see, I can't respond fast enough to inbound inquiries. This is why I strongly recommend tools like HubSpot and other things to help you monitor inbound traffic, to help you be able to, to, to understand when customers are looking at your website and digging in deep and so forth. This is totally about fast speed. Now, the challenge here is that the customer's already raised their hand. So the customer is somewhat educated. But let's switch and let's focus on outbound. This outbound is appreciating. See, appreciate, I've got to create. The customer has to have a level of appreciation for what it is we provide them. 
See, because without that, there's really no chance. You see, so outbound is about repetition. Two of the most vital words you're ever going to find in sales is found in your shower. Yes, it's found in your shower. It's found in your shower. And look on every bottle of shampoo. Every bottle of shampoo contains these critical words when it comes to sales. Rinse and repeat. Rinse and repeat. You see, sales is about repetition. We have to create repetition. Now, the key word is not repeat. The key word really is rinse. And that's how we appreciate. That's how we create appreciate. See, it, it, it doesn't say to put shampoo in your hair, wash your hair and rinse it out and then put the same shampoo back in your hair. No, no. Rinse, it means new shampoo, a new message. And I'm going to get to that here in just a moment. But it's key for you to understand this. Sales is not a one-off process. Sales is about repetition. Sales, but what happens is too many, too many times we stop. We stop because, well, I reached out to the customer twice. I, I called them. Well, I, I sent them three emails and they haven't responded. So clearly they're not interested. No, that does not mean they're not interested. It just means they have not responded. It just means they have not responded. You have to be willing to step up. And if you don't believe, remember that first line I shared with you? If you have the ability to help someone, then it's your obligation. You see, customers did not wake up this morning thinking, wow, I hope she calls me. I hope he reaches out to me. I No, they don't know that. They don't know that then they won't know until you have dialogue with them. So I can't stress that piece enough. Now, to help us understand this, let's kind of begin breaking this down. And it's really about understanding your ICP, your ideal customer profile. You see, I don't want you focusing in on the masses. Okay, if you're Google, if you're Facebook, fine, go after the masses. But you know what? Even when they started, they didn't go after the masses. No, see, they have an ideal customer profile. And this is absolutely critical for you to understand. Now, we can call it a, a persona. We could even call it an avatar. I don't care. But you have to create an idea. Who is your ideal customer? Who is your ideal customer? And there's, there's, there's three things that we have to be able to ask ourselves about this. We have to be able to ask ourselves, what is the outcome we create? What is this common solution we can help them with, and what's the entry point? Now, the best way to determine your ICP is to ask yourself with your existing customers. Who are my existing customers? Who are my existing customers and why did they buy from me? Remember this thing I said earlier, create the value, what's the value you create? You see, what I wanna do is I want, I want to take my current customers, lay out a piece of paper, do it on a computer, whatever, and then say, what are, the outcomes we create for them. Not what we sold them, the outcomes we create. And what I have to do is I have to say, okay, what are those common solutions? What are the common solutions that I was able to share with them or could share with them that are gonna help them understand? You see, what I'm doing here is I'm now saying that I want to target all of my focus, all of my sales efforts around just those people. I wanna target, I wanna focus my marketing, efforts. I want to focus everything. And the third piece is my entry point. Because again, I may have this perfect customer, but if I can't find a way to get into them, they're not perfect. So what I might do is I might say, okay, I'm going to take these customers and okay, this is the outcome we create. I'm going to ask myself, who are other customers like that? And, and we can do set, we can use such things as if, if, if you happen to be in the US, look at SIC codes. You could simply go out and Google the company and see who else comes up or, or take a look at the person, see who they're connected to. But you get other people that are like them. You see, what I want to do is the best customers, the best new customers are always going to be similar to customers I already have. That's no brainer. What happens is, this is where sales and small businesses break down. Squirrel. 
squirrel, shiny object. We get sidetracked because what happens is we get an inquiry or somebody gets an idea that, wait a minute, wait a minute, all our customers are over here, but suddenly somebody over here raises a hand and, uh, and we start going after them. You have to remain laser focused. Don't get outside of your lane. Now, you may choose to create two or three ICPs, okay? You may have an ICP of, of a particular type of company that you service, or you may have an ICP of a particular type of person and lifestyle that you service. You may have, and, and, and you, may have, you may have a couple of subsets, of it. that's okay. I tell startups, you never wanna have more than three ICPs, three, because you can't manage. This morning I was on, on the phone with a company and helping them with their ICPs. It's a SaaS, software as a service. And we have one ICP that we're very well developed in, very well. And they're looking to develop three others. And I told him, I said, no, undertake two, undertake two, get focused in on two other ICPs because you already have one that's doing well. Then you'll have three strong ICPs. Only when you get three, do you start with a fourth one? Because otherwise what you do is you begin diluting your talent, you begin diluting your expertise, your marketing dollars and everything. And the question they came back to me, they said, well, Mark, how do we know if this is gonna be successful? Well, okay. We know it's going to be successful because you already have a couple companies. You already have a couple customers in those respective verticals. And we've looked at the out, we've gone through the exercise of helping them create, you know, or helping us understand why did they buy? What's, what's the outcome they're creating and, and who is, who is the decision maker and who's the influence? We've been able to really create a pretty good persona as to who these people are. And we say, okay, we can replicate that. Because then we were able to identify several hundred other companies in each of those verticals where we've been able to determine the entry point. You see, and what we're doing is we're focusing all of our, all of our efforts about that. Couple of these people, now, as you can imagine, this is a B2B. They are spending a tremendous amount of time out on LinkedIn every day. Now, I like LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn all the time. But I said, hold it. For one of these verticals, that vertical is never on LinkedIn. That people in that vertical are never on LinkedIn. It just happens to be an industry that they're not on LinkedIn. And I said, guys, you're, you're wasting. You're wasting You're wasting effort. You're wasting valuable effort. Get zeroed in. Get focused. Shift that effort over to some other tool. See, what you want to do is when, you, when I can become, think about this for a moment. If I throw a rock into the ocean, it creates a ripple that really nobody's gonna see anywhere. But if I have a very small pond, very small pond, and I throw a rock in, that ripple's gonna seem quite a bit bigger. Same rock, same rock. You see, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create as much, see, this is what happens when, when you make your phone calls and you make your contacts, because now what happens is, people in that vertical begin buying from you. So then they naturally start telling other people and referrals and, 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 and you get a tremendous amount of efficiency. And more importantly, more importantly, what you do is you become more confident. You see, one of the big reasons why entrepreneurs, startup businesses struggle from sales is because they're not confident about interfacing with their customer. They love their product, they love the solution that they can provide, but they're not comfortable. And what you have to do is you have to get into the speak and the language of that ICP. And if you don't, you're not going to get there. So now we got to stop and ask ourselves, how do we do this? Well, it really comes about through our point of entry, what I call a POE. POE, point of entry. Three pieces to the POE. What's the outcome statement? What's the question to engage? For instance, this morning I was talking with the sales team of a SaaS company. And the question was, Mark, what's the question? What's the question we should lead with right now? What they do is they sell a software that helps sales companies be more efficient. 
And I said, the question you should ask or be asking right now is, how confident are you in making your fourth quarter number? You see, and, and, and I said, lead with that question when you're calling prospects, when you're calling people, and, and they do cold calling. Ooh, cold calling. Yeah, but hold it. Remember, they're calling people in their vertical. They're calling people who, know, who they know they can help. So it's not cold calling at all. They know they can help these people. And they know in this vertical, they're struggling. They're struggling from a sales standpoint. So guess what? Question to engage. How, how confident are you in making your fourth quarter number? See, what happens to me times is we as, as entrepreneurs, we love to start off by, by telling people how wonderful we are and how we do this and this and this. And they go, I don't care. You see, they have a challenge. They have a problem. And what I want to do is I want to come at them very quickly. I'll walk you through the exact example that I use. And you can use whether it be in phone calls, whether you use an email, you can do it in, in whatever. But this is the approach. Hey, how confident are you in making the fourth quarter? Uh, who are you? Well, I'm Mark Hunter. Oh, and, and, and how confident are you? Well, why are you asking me? Well, I work with other companies just like yours to help them make their sales numbers. You see, my qualifying statement is I've worked with other companies just like yours. I love that line. Nobody wants to be the first one. Nobody, especially in this, in this pandemic-filled world that we're in right now, nobody wants to be the first one. But see, I can even use that in an email. I can use that in a voicemail. I, I, I don't start off by saying, hi, I'm Mark Hunter. I, I help companies like yours. No, I'll start off in an email and I'll, I'll hit them with a question. And then in that second, third sentence, then I'll say, hey, I, I've, I've helped other companies similar to yours. Yeah. And the call to action, CTA, call to action. You see, every time I reach out to somebody, I got to have a CTA. If, if, if any of you have got kids, you'll know that they always have a CTA, right? <laughs> They're always hitting you up. They're always asking you, okay, because they got a CTA. They want you to know, give them some money. They want keys to the car. They want a smartphone. They want, they want to stay up late at night. They always have a call to action. Hmm, wow. Even a, a young baby has a call to action when they start crying. They want to be fed or they want their diaper changed. You see, this again is a major piece that people tend to leave out. We don't sit there and we don't put in place the CTA. Okay, so what's the rhythm? What's the process? Let me share with you this. It's what I call C plus C equals C equals O equals P. What the heck is that? I talk about this in my book, A Mind for Sales. C plus C equals C equals O equals P. Let's kind of break down the definition here. First C is continuity, continuity. Second C is competence. Third C is confidence. Fourth C is opportunity. And the fifth one is profit. As a startup, you probably get excited when a customer reaches out to you and they say, hey, give me a price, give me a price. Well, let me tell you something. Anytime somebody asks you for a price, you do not give them a price unless you know that there's a level of confidence that's confidence that has been established. Because otherwise, all they're doing, A, they're either buying on price, and oh, but guess what? Price is not a sustainable competitive advantage. Or B, or B, worse yet, they're just taking your price to shop you against somebody else. They have no intention to buy from you. They have no intention. So let's walk through the C plus C equals C. First C is continuity. Your reputation arrives before you do. Nobody does business with anybody without first reaching out. If you think about this, you did not sign up for this webinar today without probably Googling Mark Hunter. Who is this Mark Hunter, the sales hunter? Or you had enough confidence already established from previous engagements with the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. But you undoubtedly did some research. See, there has to be a level of continuity. And, and you said, okay, I'm going to sign up for this event 
to hear Mark Hunter because I, I've done other events. I've signed up for other events with NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. They've been, they've been really good. You see, it's the continuity. You see, we have to create enough continuity. This is where social media comes into play. This is where advertising comes into play. This is where marketing comes into play. Because what I'm doing is I'm creating a level of awareness for my company. But as a startup, as a startup, as a small business, you can't afford to do advertising and marketing everywhere. You just can't. You've got to put your effort very, very targeted. This is where I say your ICP is critical not only from a sales standpoint, but from a marketing standpoint. Because if I've only got a few arrows that I can shoot, if I've only got a few messages I can, I got to make sure they hit, I got to make sure they hit my audience. Now, continuity from a sales standpoint is also probably you picking up the phone, picking up the phone and making a phone, whoa, 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 making a phone call. Yeah, making a phone call. I'm finding right now in this pandemic area, in, people are having better phone calls than ever because we're in a disjointed, disconnected world. And it's amazing, but people are having more success with the telephone than I think we, we've seen for the last seven or eight years. It's been powerful. And even if they don't pick up the phone, I can still leave a voicemail. Here's the whole thing. Here's why I like the telephone. I can, I can have a 30 second conversation with you and exchange more information and learn more than I would probably in the four or five emails. Yeah. See, people are afraid to pick up the phone because, well, what, what if they say no? It's okay. Uh, I have yet to see a headline on the internet anywhere that says salesperson lost an arm. Salespeople, uh, salesperson was shot, was murdered, was maimed bled to death because they made a sales call. It just doesn't happen. You see, if you believe in how you can help people, if you believe, if you believe in how you can help people, you owe it, you owe it to them to reach out to them. You owe it to them. Just as an example I used at the beginning of the car accident. You don't know those people. Now, you don't know if you can help them. You, 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 may, be, you may be a medic. You may be, I, you don't know, but, but you're going to stop and help. Yes. You see, continuity is about being out there enough. So I got to be out there enough. Now, competence. This is where it really comes into play. Comp competence is not about the information you share. Competence is about the questions you ask. Whoa, head spinner. Head spin. Yes. It's about the questions you ask. Because see, what I got to do is I got to get the customer thinking. I got to get them reflecting. Because see, if all I do is share information, I don't learn much. But if I get you, if I ask you a question, see, remember that question I said, hey, how confident are you in making your fourth quarter? See, what I want to do in a sales call and let's be very blunt, let's be very brutal. My point on a sales call, unless I'm selling pencils, is not to close the sale. Because if I, if, if I haven't talked to you before, you're, you're not going to buy from me on the first call. You, you, you're not. What I want to do is I want to earn the right, the privilege, honor, and respect to be able to talk with you again. In order for me to do that, I've got to do a couple things. First thing is I've just got to have you share with me one piece of information? Because if you share with me one piece of information, now I have the ability to follow up with you. Because remember, so many times what happens is the prospect winds up ghosting us. They ghost us. They never respond. And they never respond because all we're doing is sharing with them information. I had a person send me this morning a four email series from a salesperson. And oh boy, you could tell it was robo developed. Oh man, it was bad. He sent it to me as a, Worst case scenario, bad example. And I said, yep, it was right out of a playbook, right out of a playbook. And he said, you know what's embarrassing for that guy is he never even bothered to pick up the phone and call me. Yet my telephone number's all over my website and everything else. And he's in an industry where they use a the telephone. You see, what's interesting is 
all this person was doing was just dumping data, dumping information. Competence is about the, so what I wanna do is I want to, I want to be able to ask you questions. Now here's, here's why I come back to the ICP. Because if I'm just zeroed in on this ICP, I'm beginning to understand what makes you tick, what you're looking for, what, what makes you so good, where your needs are. And I can begin asking you questions. And oh, by the way, when I begin asking you questions that are relevant to who you are and your industry, you are no longer looking at me as a salesperson. You're looking at me as a, hmm, this person can help me. She can really help me. He can really help me. That's what you're trying to get to. You see, when I get to that point, then I create confidence. And confidence cuts both ways. Confidence cuts both ways. See, I have to have you confident with me, and I have to be confident with you. And if you've shared with me some information, now we'll say I have a quick phone call, or maybe I get an email from you or something like that, and you just share one piece of information. I can pick up the phone. I can, hey, by the way, last Tuesday when we talked, <coughs> excuse me, you mentioned X. I'd like to get some more insight on that. Or see, this is what's interesting. One of the best ways to not have a customer ghost you, a prospect ghost you, is to by asking them a question on something specifically that they shared with you. Hey, wow. He's asking me a question about something I shared. He must think I'm important. He values my opinion. People always love talking about their views, talking about the information that they shared. Yeah. It's one of the best ways that I've found to keep somebody engaged. Now, what I'm doing is I'm creating a level of confidence here. Only after I've created a level of confidence, and one of the easiest ways to determine whether confidence has been reached is whether or not the prospect has shared with you a piece of proprietary information. Now, what's proprietary? A piece of information not known publicly. Because think about this. You won't share information with somebody unless you have a level of confidence with them. You know, that's not known publicly. When you get that, now I've got, to, now I've got the opportunity. And I'm at that point where I can now put the opportunity on the table. The opportunity is the solution. And when I put that on the table, see, now I'm putting it on in the context of, I know where they're coming from. I know what their needs are. And ultimately I get to P, P, profit. Profit is not a dirty word. Profit is a beautiful word. You can't afford to discount your price. Even in a pandemic, you can't afford to cut your price. Because when you cut your price, you no longer have the revenue to be able to invest back into your business. And oh, by the way, think about this for a moment. Profit cuts both ways. Profit, profit is not a dirty word to the customer. Because guess what? The customer is looking for an outcome. The customer is looking for a solution. Later this week, I'm getting on an airplane. Yeah, I'm getting on an airplane. I've been doing some flights around the country. And it's interesting. And, and flights are quite cheap right now, as, as you can well imagine. As you can well imagine, flights are quite cheap. What's interesting is I didn't pick the cheapest flight. I did not pick, because I have a kind of a tight schedule that I've got to get. And there's one airline that had one flight that was actually fairly more, substantially more but I paid for it. I paid that price for that ticket on that airline at that time because it matched my outcome. You see, don't think for a moment that customers buy on price. Customers buy because of the outcome that they're looking for. And I'm gonna find out the outcome because of the dialogue I'm creating through the C plus C equals C. And when I understand that, it's amazing how much better I can find. This is where I say, Stay in your lane and sell within your market. One more comment on P, profit, price. More discounts are given because the salesperson or the company fails to believe in their own price than are given based on the demands of the customer. What do I, what do I mean by that? It is amazing how quickly people cave. Well, the customer says, uh, do you have any discounts available? Well, we've just been trained to ask that question. What's the discount? What, we've just been trained to ask that question. 
very quick example, very quick story. I was, I was uh, looking to do some work with a, with a company in the Midwest part of the United States. They operate in about 14 states in the Midwest. They're a distributor. And company was really ready to hire me, but the CEO would not talk to me. And the CEO would not sign off the deal until the CEO called me. CEO called me. And what we had found out through our research, through working with them, is they wanted, they, they wanted to bring me in because they had a major competitor from the East Coast that was going to expand into the Midwest. And they were afraid of losing a considerable amount of their business. We knew that was their pain. That was their pain, this major competitor. So the CEO called me up and said, Mark, by the way, your price is way too high. You'll need to reduce it before we agree to hire you. My response to him is, is no, I won't. How much business do you expect to lose because of the new competitor coming in? There was a pause. Then he came back and he said, that was good. You're hired. You're right. I need you. You see, it would have been easy for me to sit there and say, I'll cave my price. I'll cave my price. Oh, because that's what he asked me for. But, but I didn't because I knew what his pain was. His pain was so significant. When you know what the pain is, it's amazing. I only got two minutes left and I got one more slide I want to share with you. And that's this. What does it take? What's your role? Your role, tie, goals, belief, and commitment. And I want you to get very focused in on this. I want you to get very focused. I'm going to talk for about 90 seconds on this. And I know we got some questions. We're going to open up here at 45 minutes after the hour. Time. You have to be willing to put the time into sales. Sales is not an afterthought. You've got to put it into your calendar and say, this is sales effort. You got to put it in your diary. And when you put it in, you got to put it in as CFT, customer facing time. You see, I can, I can spend time in sales by responding to LinkedIn stuff and doing all kinds of other, oh, I'll, let, me, let me work on this SEO. Let me, no, that, that's marketing. Sales is CFT, customer facing time. Two, what are your goals? What are the goals that you want to achieve? And be specific and be realistic. Too many times what happens is startups set themselves up goals that they can't achieve. And they set themselves up for, or they hire a salesperson and they put their, no, no, no. Goals must be realistic because it comes down to what's your belief. Your belief has to be, do you believe that you can truly help the customer? Because when you believe that you can help the customer, it's not what you sell. It's not what you sell. You see, what I sell, what I sell is not consulting, is not sales uh, analytical work and sales support work. No. My objective, my objective is to help businesses be successful. I've just found that the best medium for me to do that is doing what I do. That's the belief. And the fourth one is the commitment. I can get you a membership to a gym, but a membership to a gym does not make you fit. You have to use it. You have to use it. You see, if you're going to be committed to sales, you have to be committed to sales. That means it must be a process that you do every day, every day you're selling. Okay, it's 45 minutes after the hour. I want to open it back up. And I think we got some questions that are coming in. So fire away. Amazing. Thank you so much, Mark. That was great. Um, got a couple questions coming in from the from the attendees. Let's start off with the first one from Dave. What if our first few early adopters ha happen to be anecdotal rather than typical and not really represent the market? Wouldn't yep. we be misled by targeting more customers? Would we be misled by targeting more customers like them or when they're only outliers? Wouldn't it be better to think critically about these first few and sort out what about them is good? What is a, What about them is a good guide for future customers and what about them is particular? Here. Yes, I never want to develop my ICP based off of three or four or five or six customers. I have to have a statistically viable list of customers. So I may have some anecdotal customers and I'm going to, I just don't know. So I may have to go on a little bit of a fishing expedition and create kind of a, a fake ICP and just try it. That's what we actually had to do in this company I was sharing with you this, I was sharing with you. The SaaS example, one of the verticals that we're actually in right now was because of a fishing expedition we started about nine months ago. 
So, right. That's a great question. Don't get misled just because of some fake early reads. Amazing. Um, and we won't have time to get to every question, but we'll try our best. So if you guys have any other questions, they're rolling mm -hmm. into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Mark, up next is any advice on identifying the decision maker? And I think they're talking about the economic buyer here. Yes, the economic buyer. Here's one of the questions. Here's a question I love to ask. How have you made decisions like this in the past? How have you made decisions like this in the past? I love asking that question because what I'm listening for is what's the process they've used, other names they come up, other things. The other question I love to ask is, how are you going to measure the value you're going to receive from this? And again, I'm listing for things. I'm listing for names. It is absolutely important that you've got to have that decision maker, the economic buyer present before you put the opportunity on, on the table. But I love doing that. What you don't like, what I do not like asking is, so are you the decision maker? Now think about that. If you're a customer and some salesperson is talking to you, are you the decision? That offends me. That's going to offend me. So I, I don't like asking that question. But the other two, I very much do like. Amazing. Um, this is a large one, but let's see if we can break it down. Um, how do you get your first or first five or first 10 customers? This is, this is great. First of all, figure out what is, what, is the, what is the outcome that you believe you can create, okay? What's the value you can create? And then say, okay, who is probably going to be the most likely type of person to want that? Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to identify, depending on what you're selling and so forth, 20, 25, maybe 100, maybe I have to identify 500 people that could potentially fit that profile. And I'm going to target just them. I'm going to target just them with the idea being to get one, two, or 10. Again, depends on them, whether or not what you're selling is an expense. Is it a capital expenditure? Is it a consumable? Is it a, you know, a lot of different criteria, but you have to start with the outcome that you think you're going to create back your way into a profile, identify people and go. Amazing. Super helpful. Um, this is an interesting one and it's a great progression through our questions. At what point do you engage slash hire a sales expert in a startup that's pre-rev after MVP? I like hiring a salesperson early on. I'm going to make that one of my first steps. But here's the whole thing. You do not hire a salesperson and then say, oh, good. I got the sales thing covered. It's all done. Hiring a salesperson and expecting them to go out and do it is kiss of death. All you're going to do is create turnover. You have to own the position, which means you as the owner, you as the, as, the, as the managing partner, whatever your role in, you have to assume a very heavy role in sales. You cannot, you hire a salesperson, but you do not outsource and you do not forget, abdicate the sales responsibility. You have to be part of it. Because if, if you're not part of it, they will drown very quickly. Amazing. Um, Marlon asks about uh, social media marketing and how to ap approach potential clients in that business. I love social media marketing. We do a lot of it. I, I have a lot of online programs that we sell by way of social media and it works great. But we stay, again, very, very targeted with all of our pay-per-click with all of the things that we do, we stay very, very on focus. We're very deliberate with our calendar in terms of when we put things out because there's some pieces that we treat as purely informational. Some are more marketing focused. Some have message. Everything has a theme, but we create a master plan. And then what that does is that then drives or supports or mirrors up to our sales efforts. So I know this is what I should be focusing. This is what, our, what my salesperson should be focusing on. But you have to create, don't do things in a one-off scenario and fix your back door first, fix your website first. No sense in doing social media if your website sucks. Super helpful. Um, Somebody's asking about the, can you talk a little bit more about your call to action advice? Um, what are your favorites? How do you break the ice? Yeah, my favorite, call, my favorite call to action is, is, hey, 
what's your calendar look like this afternoon at 4.30 for a phone call? I'm going to come right at them and I'm going to say right at them, hey, what's your calendar look like tomorrow? Or what's this? What I don't like as a call to action is, can I send you some information? That's not a call to action. That's an easy way out. Call to action requires action on your part and the prospect's part. So that's why I say, I'm, I'm going to sit there and I'm going to call for a meeting. Now, they may say, oh, well, you know, send me, send me some information. Uh, I, I, I don't want to meet with you. My response to that is, hey, I could send you a lot of information, but I, 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 I don't want to junk up your inbox. Let me ask you two questions. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you two questions. So, so how confident are you really about making your fourth quarter number? Or, or so I, I'm going to ask them a real controversial question to engage them. Now, I may get them over the hurdle. I may not. I don't care, but I'm going to try. And even if they reject me, you know what? I'm still going to keep coming back at them. I'm going to come back at them at, at a later time with some new insights, some new questions, some new, some, some new something. Just because somebody rejects me once does not mean um, I'm going to allow them to stay rejected forever. A customer who says no to, remember, no is only a moment in time. No is never permanent. Amazing. Well, I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions. And thank you so much, Mark. Um, during targeted cold calls, what should be stated? How do you get them to state their problems? Well, yeah, that, that's why I like on this one for this SaaS company I was working with. I said, so what you do is you call up and say, hey, Ross, Mark Hunter, hey, how confident are you in making your fourth quarter number? And they're going to sit there and say, who are you? Well, I, I'm, I'm Mark Hunter with so-and-so. And how confident are you? And, and they're probably going to sit there and say, well, why are you calling? And I'm going to sit there and say, well, I've, I've worked with other companies just similar to yours in helping them make their sales numbers. So what are some of the challenges you think you're going to face in the fourth quarter? You see what I'm doing? I'm, I'm pushing to get them to engage. I'm pushing them. Because if all I do is share with you information, um, why, why did I need to call you? Remember, a telephone conversation means it's two-way. I, I got to engage you. I come at you with questions. Amazing advice. Um, you, so speaking of phone calls, we had one question come in from the um, registration form. And it's around the same category, but it's what's the best way to sell on Zoom? I love selling on Zoom. Zoom is great because I get to see you. So what, what I'll do is I may sit there and I may call you up and say, hey, great. Let, let me share with you a couple examples. Um, let's jump over to Zoom right now. Is that okay? So I'm going to sit there. Now, what you don't, what you want to do when you're selling on Zoom, one quick thing, you have to control the message, especially if you're selling something, if you're selling software or something like that. Because what you don't want is you don't want the customer hijack. Hey, can you show me this? Can you show me that? Can you show me this? No. You have to control the conversation. You have to control it. Because otherwise, you're going to allow them to go down whatever path they want to go down. But I love selling off of Zoom. But you know what's very interesting is, I don't know if you noticed this, but I'm looking right into the camera. And the camera is actually about two feet above my monitor. So I really can't quite see you. I know you're there. I know you're there. <laughs> I'm seeing you out of the corner of my eye. But I'm really giving you eye contact. That's great advice. Um, as I don't look at my camera. <laughs> um, Mark, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to our community and our entrepreneurs today. Your insights um, and sharing your insights uh, and setting such a great overview of your sales tips. Um, on behalf of myself and everyone at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center, we sincerely appreciate you joining us. So thanks again, and hopefully everybody out there uh, in attendee land and on Facebook have found a lot of value from what you did because I definitely did. So appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. We have some other events coming up this week. Um, how to leverage a, a advanced AI technology and attract uh, to attract and engage stakeholders with Aaron from Summary. Tomorrow, we've got Mastering the VC Fundraising Pitch with Sergio Marrero. And Thursday, we've got how to guide the per perfect customer journey with John Josh. Um, so if you guys are interested, 
We'll follow up with more information on those events, but really appreciate all of you joining us. And again, big shout out to Mark Hunter, the sales hunter for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing all of you online and hopefully in person soon.